and uh, look forward to offering amendments that will help us get there. I thank the chair and would yield the floor. The absence of a quorum. Uh, Mr. President, I ask that the quorum be lifted, the call, quorum call be lifted. Without objection to the uh, senator from Connecticut. And I ask that uh, I be permitted to speak as if in morning business. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I agree with my distinguished colleague from Alabama that the United States Senate can no longer deal with serious issues relating to economic and national security as if we were doing business as usual. I have slightly different views, in some instances radically different views, but I hope on the issue that I will discuss here that we can really come together on a bipartisan basis in support of the Teachers and First Responders Back to Work Act, which I am co-sponsoring. And I hope for a bipartisan support because this bill should be about as far from a partisan issue as can be. I hope we can all agree that what America needs at this moment in our history is policies that put America back to work and help to protect and create jobs. We need to put Connecticut back to work and every state in our union back to work with policies that favor not just our national security and make us safer and more secure, but also invest in our workforce for the future. And there's no better place to start than with teachers and first responders. Funding these two professional areas is much more than an immediate need. It is a common sense solution and a national priority in promoting safe and secure communities and a highly educated workforce. We all know the numbers. Tens of thousands of jobs, 300,000 jobs to be more precise in our schools have been lost due to budget cuts in the last few years. In Connecticut alone, 3,600 jobs have been lost in our schools. Those numbers are not just abstract, speculative statistics. Each of them attests to an individual whose potential creativity in the classroom and possible contribution to our young people has been lost. It attests to the loss of individualized attention to students at a critical point in their lives when they need that kind of care. And every one of them means an educator, probably another educator, is stretched farther, burdened more in the capacity to provide a positive learning environment for our kids. The teachers that would be supported by this bill are not numbers, they are not statistics, they are vital to our most precious resource, our children. And this bill is not about only their fate, it is about our children. It is about the quality of their learning. And it's about the quality of our future workforce in this nation. When manufacturers tell us as we go home that they need people with the skills to match jobs that exist now or will be created in the future, this measure will help to provide them with the workforce they need and deserve to make things in America and to make sure that America is competitive in the world economy. This measure meets our most urgent priorities, our children, our competitiveness in the world, and our security and safety in our communities. We all know that fiscal challenges have forced our towns and cities to make cuts going to the bone of what they feel is fundamental and essential to our schools and also to our first responders. And this bill is, in a sense, an emergency response, a first response to those needs. 
Because if we fail to meet this challenge, the lives of our children will be changed forever. The lives of children in Connecticut affected by those 3,600 teachers will be diminished and degraded forever by the loss of classes and tutoring and teams that will be ended. Our first responders need this bill as much as our teachers, and not just our first responders, but the people that they serve. Every day, we urge our children to follow their example, their integrity, their commitment, their service. And yet, as budgets have been cut, we've been all too willing to cut the first responders, who should be the last to go. This approach not only weakens our economy, it weakens the safety of our neighborhoods and our communities. And this bill is just common sense about putting those people back in their jobs, back on their routes, back in their cars and vans and their offices. The numbers are not sufficient to tell the whole story, but those numbers are staggering. This bill will invest $30 billion to support state and local efforts, which otherwise would be lost. These efforts to retrain, rehire, recruit good people for these jobs in Connecticut and around the country are absolutely essential. The shortfall of $2.9 billion in Connecticut as a result of this fiscal crisis has been stunningly impactful to our state. We have been forced to slash funding for programs, and the 3,600 jobs lost in Connecticut will take their toll in a slowed recovery and an extended downturn. The Teachers and First Responders Back to Work Act will provide Connecticut with an additional $336 million to support 3,800 positions that are essential to our children, and the safety of our communities. This money will give a boost to the state's economy and improve education. And we know it is undeniable, and we know that we need these positions in Connecticut. We need them in the country. America needs to get back to work. And we know that teachers and re first responders are the right place to begin. Let me just close by saying, as I go around my state, what people tell me and they're not politicians. Some of them could be less interested in politics. But they're concerned that classes are canceled, that teams are uncoached, that music and arts programs are ended, and that their students are untutored. They want action. They want decisions from this body. We have an obligation to meet those needs and to provide this response for teachers and first responders. And I urge that we do so on a bipartisan basis in a effort that is fully funded from the tax on millionaires that we have proposed. Thank you, Mr. President, and I yield the floor. Quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka. The Senate and a quorum calls a continued debate today on 2012 spending. Earlier, though, a number of Republican members talked about detainee policy in the defense authorization bill. John Donnelly of CQ writes this afternoon that the majority leader appears to be backing off his insistence that the Senate not take up defense authorization unless certain provisions are removed relating to accused terrorists in detention 
In remarks today, Senator Reid said he was committed to passing the measure, and he said if voting on it in, quote, regular order is the only way to do that, then he would accept that. In another, on another issue in terms of spending, Stephen Dennis of Roll Call writes this afternoon that a gentleman's agreement reached earlier this year between Republican and Democratic Senate leaders has, quote, broken down big time, according to the majority leader. He complained on the Senate floor this afternoon that Republicans haven't held up there under the bargain in helping keeping the Senate running smoothly with a minimum of procedural roadblocks. That's uh, the reporting of Stephen Dennis of Roll Call. The underlying work in the Senate, amendments related to 2012 spending, the uh, measure three bills rolled up into one, including agriculture, commerce, justice, and science, and the transportation and housing urban development bill. And the uh, debate, debate continues in the U.S. Senate today. No word on any um, particular uh, amendment votes, however. The House is out this week. It's their district work period. They will return next week. And President Obama, on the second of three days of his bus trip in Virginia and North Carolina, a couple of stops today, and we'll show you some of that later in our program schedule.
Consent uh, quorum call be suspended. Without objection. And consent to speak in morning business. Without objection. Mr. President, tomorrow night we expect 15 million Americans, including a lot of children, to tune in to the watch the first game of the World Series. It's a big deal for a lot of people and a lot of families. We watch our heroes uh, in the championship of that great American sport of baseball. There are many fans on both sides, of course, with Texas and St. Louis facing off. I know where Senator Blunt will be, rooting for his Cardinals, and I'll be joining him in that effort. Uh, it will be a great contest. We look forward to it. But I want to raise another issue related to baseball, which several of my colleagues joined in today uh, in a letter that we sent to Major League Baseball and to the Players Association. Senators Lautenberg, Harkin, Blumenthal, and I today called on Major League Baseball Players Association to ban the use of all tobacco products, including smokeless tobacco, on the field, in the dugout, and in the locker rooms at all Major League Baseball venues. You see, unfortunately, among those 15 million fans are a lot of children who watch every move that their heroes on the diamond will make. And as they watch those, they undoubtedly note that little puff in the lip, that can in the pocket, and they think that's part of being a great baseball player. They decide that they too want to be great baseball players and they're just going to imitate the conduct of those baseball major leaguers. The 2009 National Youth Risk Behavior Survey found that the use of smokeless tobacco products has increased by 36 percent among high school boys since 2003. And the proportion of high school boys using smokeless tobacco is now an alarming 15 percent of all high school boys in America. It's no wonder. Tobacco companies spend millions on advertisements tailored to attract young people to use tobacco products. The industry more than doubled its marketing for smokeless products between 2005 and 2008 to a record $547.9 million. The letter that we sent points out, major league ball players who use smokeless tobacco at games are providing celebrity endorsements for these tobacco products, which encourage many young people to take up smokeless tobacco. It's a dangerous product. We know that every year tobacco kills 443,000 Americans, most of whom started their tobacco addiction as teenagers. The Surgeon General, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and the National Cancer Institute have concluded that smokeless tobacco causes cancers of the stomach, larynx, esophagus, and oral cancer, and can result in disfiguring, sur disfiguring surgery Pan pancreatic cancer, and one of the deadliest forms of cancer, as I mentioned, pancreatic cancer. The use of smokeless tobacco is linked to cardiovascular disease, gum disease, tooth decay, and mouth lesions. Mr. President, this has been a battle I've been engaged in for a long time. I started off battling the tobacco companies over smoking on airplanes over 25 years ago. I won that battle, and I didn't know at the time that that victory, along with my colleague Senator Lautenberg, was a tipping point in America. From that point forward, people started asking questions. If it's not safe to smoke tobacco in an airplane, why is it safe in a train, a bus, an office, a school, a hospital? And one by one, those opportunities to smoke in those places started to close up. People today would find it incredible. In fact, many young people still can't believe it, that we would allow people to smoke on an airplane. But many of us remember it well. America has changed, but when it comes to smokeless tobacco, I'm calling on Major League Baseball and the Players Association to be part of positive change on behalf of their young fans. Let them set an example in their negotiations with the Major League Baseball owners to eliminate tobacco from the baseball field, the dugout, and all aspects of the game of baseball. That would be a great message. It will not only show responsible conduct on the part of the baseball players, but it will show their fans how much they love them, that they're willing to make an extra sacrifice to protect them from the dangers of smokeless tobacco. It's not a new battle. I've been involved in this before, and I've called on Major League Baseball before. I can tell you that Bud Selig is uh, strongly in favor of what I'm asking for. I talked to him on the phone just a few weeks ago. But it really comes down to this negotiation the contract between the players and the owners. And usually it becomes a bargaining chip at the table. 
Let's not let the health and safety of young baseball fans across America be a bargaining chip between the major league players and the owners. Let's win one for the kids across America. I hope that the major league baseball players will show the leadership which I know they can show and eliminate smokeless tobacco from the game of baseball and really give our kids across America the greatest baseball fans in the world the help that they need to avoid this deadly habit. Mr. President, I yield the floor. And Mr. President. Mr. President. Senator from Maryland. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Mr. President, I rise to oppose a pending amendment. I rise to oppose the amendment offered by the Senator from Arizona, Senator McCain. Uh, that is amendment number 740. Mr. President, this amendment would eliminate any funding under the Economic Development Administration for trade adjustments assistance. Trade, adjustments, trade adjustment assistance under the Economic Development Administration is $15.8 million. This amendment would stop EDA from implementing the, the TAA for something called the FIRMS program which was just reauthorized last week by the Senate. The, TA, the Trade Adjustment Assistance for Firms is the only program specifically designed to help small manufacturers hurt by import competition. Let me emphasize, it's the little guys. It's the machine tool shop. It's the small to medium-sized business that we go hoorah, hoorah for in the Senate all of the time. But when it comes to helping them, when they've been hurt by trade imports or their intellectual property has been stolen, we're not going to give them help. I oppose this amendment. The Economic Development Administration is in the Commerce Justice uh, Science Subcommittee. It was reauthorized by the Senate. Now, under the bill that was passed, uh, it would have provide technical assistance matching federal funds to help develop and implement a plan to help them get back on their feet. It's a competitive grant program, and the largest grant is $75,000. Now, the trade, adjust, uh, the trade adjustment assistance for something called the FIRMS program was created back in 1974. 1974. It was under Gerald Ford to help small business and small manufacturers adjust to increased imports and increased international competition. The, the 2011 Trade Adjustment Assistance Bill passed last week authorized this program at $16 million and said the EDA should manage it. The CJS follows the authorizing direction, as we should. Trade adjustment assistance for the firm's program, the small business, helps them adjust, retool, and stay competitive in an increasingly global economy. In 2010, this program enabled 334, 330 firms to devise strategies to get back on track. What did it help them do? Identify new markets, improve efficiencies in their operation and also help them identify additional financing. 98% of the companies that participated are still in business after five years. Without TAA for the firm's program, many of these communities, excuse me, many of these companies would be out of business. Since 2006, it is estimated that over 50,000 manufacturing jobs were saved because of this. You know, manufacturing is the backbone of America. One of the reasons we're in the economic turmoil that we're in now is that we've lost so much to manufacturing. Now, we give all kinds of tax breaks to send jobs overseas. We also do bailouts to help the really big boys, like the automobile industry, and we had to help them. I understand that. But for these small, medium-sized businesses, some of which that I visited in my own state, they need this kind of help when they're whacked by often subsidized 
imports. You know, many of my companies know how to compete with other companies, but they often feel they're competing with other countries. They know what to do, and we need to be able to help them do it. Trade adjustment assistance is important. If we don't invest in helping our manufacturers stay in the global game, we're going to lose out. So we would hope that we would defeat the McCain Amendment. During the Senate consideration of the trade adjustment bill, our colleague, our, the other senator from Arizona, offered an amendment to strike the program then. It failed 43 by 54. I hope this amendment fails again. Let's use some of the federal help to be able to help those that are creating jobs. If we really want to talk about creating jobs and creating jobs in manufacturing, let's leave this program modest, small. For $15 million, we could really help small business and medium-sized business learn how to get back on their feet after they've been whacked off and by unfair and anti-competitive trade practices. Mr. President, uh, I yield the floor. Senator from Arizona. President, uh, if it's agreeable to the managers, I will discuss two of my amendments. One, the amendment to prohibit the use of transportation enhancement grants to fund certain projects, and the other, number 740, the eliminate to eliminate funding for trade adjustment assistance for firms. Is that agreeable? I thank uh, the Senator from Maryland. Uh, first, I'd like to talk about the amendment that would remedy the misplaced priorities of Congress by focusing valuable transportation dollars on improving our nation's crumbling infrastructure. Under present current law, 10% of funding provided from the Surface Transportation Program must be used for transportation enhancement activities. Let me make it clear. When you pay your taxes on a gallon of gasoline and it's sent to Washington, 10%, $0.10 cents out of every other one of those dollars is, has to be used for transportation and enhancement activities. If the state's priorities is to rebuild a bridge, 10% of it has to go to transportation enhancement. If the state's priority is to build a new freeway, then too bad. 10 cents out of every dollar still must be spent on, quote, transportation enhancement activities, such as transportation museums, like the Corbett Museum in Kentucky, the White Squirrel Sanctuary in Tennessee, landscaping along Vegas, Las Vegas highways, walkways and bike paths and other activities. Now, many of these programs may be valuable, and they could be valuable, but shouldn't, rather than a mandated 10% be used for those purposes, shouldn't the states and the local authorities be the ones to make those decisions? if they think that the money could be better spent on other priorities, rather than we here in Congress mandating that 10 percent should be used for transportation enhancement activities. Now, our, everybody knows, and the President has spoken eloquently about our nation's highways, roads, and bridges are crumbling in need of repair. So it doesn't make sense to mandate any federal dollars to something other than those, especially since the priorities of the state and local governments may be very different. The amendment would prohibit funding in the bill for seven of the 12 transportation enhancement activities. Specifically, funding would be prohibited for scenic or historic highway programs, including tourist and welcome centers, landscaping and scenic beautification, historic preservation, rehabilitation and operation of historic transportation buildings, structures or facilities, control and removal of outdoor advertising, archaeological planning and research, and establishment of transportation museums. Now, I will be the first to say that some of those are good programs. Some of those may be necessary, but none of them need to be mandated. 
It would not prohibit, this amendment does not prohibit funding for pedestrian and bicycle facilities, pedestrian and bicycle safety and education activities, conversion of abandoned railway corridors to trails, environmental mitigation of highway runoff pollution, reduce vehicle caused wildlife mortality, maintain habitat connectivity, and acquisition of scenic easements and scenic or historic sites. Frankly, I would like to see it all eliminated, but I can understand an argument for the five that are not included in this amendment. Now, we're talking about real money. According to the Department of Transportation, almost $1 billion was educated for transportation enhancement funds in 2011. Since, 2000, since 1992, more than $12 billion has gone to these programs. You know, my colleagues can argue that these are important. I argue that it makes more sense to stop forcing states to spend this money on flowers and museums and allow them to spend it on 146,633 deficient bridges in this country. My home state of Arizona alone has 903 deficient bridges. And if the state of Arizona should want that money spent to repair bridges, it seems to me that they should be allowed their priorities rather than 10% of it being mandated for any purpose, much less those seven that are outlined in the amendment. We know what the debt is, $14.8 trillion. We, we, we've got to spend our money on fiscally, in a fiscally responsible manner and not on special interest projects. For example, Tennessee, the state of Tennessee, has more than 3,800 deficient bridges. Because of this federal mandate, however, states are forced to spend valuable and limited transportation dollars on transportation enhancement projects, such as the White Squirrel Sanctuary in Kenton, Tennessee. Kenton, the home of the White Squirrel, has spent $269,404 on the sanctuary. The funding for the White Squirrel Sanctuary was used for construction of walking trails, including brick crosswalks, footbridge, and trailhead parking within Kenton to provide for the safe observation of white squirrels. The Lincoln Highway 200-mile roadside museum in Pennsylvania received $300,000 in enhancement funding to commemorate the historical roadway with several items along the 200-mile route. These funds were used for items such as signs, quote, colorful vintage gas pumps painted by local artists, and this refurbished coffee pot, refurbished coffee pot, um, pictured on this poster board. Meanwhile, Pennsylvania ranks first out of all states for deficient bridges, yet it seems to be more important to refurbish large roadside coffee pots. Instead of spending money on fixing California's 7,091 deficient bridges, federally mandated tax dollars were spent on antique bike collections, a dragon gateway, and a sculpture for a parking lot in Laguna Beach. Specifically, California received $440,000 to purchase and display 60 antique bikes for its bicycle museum collection. Los Angeles spent $250,000 to aid in the construction of the Twin Dragons Gateway entrance to the Chinatown area. The National Corvette Museum in Kentucky received $198,000 to build a National Corvette Museum simulator theater while well, over 1,300 bridges in Kentucky are deficient and 3,000 are functionally obsolete, meaning they do not meet current design standards. Now, I, I must say, from the interest of full disclosure, I have a special feeling for the Corvette. My first means of transportation on graduation from the Naval Academy was a modest model of the Corvette, and 
I almost wanted to take this out, but since a National Corvette Museum simulator theater has very little to do with, uh, with transportation enhancement, I felt compelled to add this in. Nevada spent millions of federal transportation dollars to make Vegas highways beautiful. In 2008, Nevada received $6.3 million in transportation enhancement grants. Instead of spending the money on road upgrades or repairing the 804 deficient bridges, the money was used for landscaping projects. For instance, $498,750 $498, went for decorative rocks, native plants, some pavement graphics, a few walls, and some great big granite boulders to beautify and interchange to Las Vegas 215 Beltway. I think it's a very beautiful boulder. Um, Nevada also spent $319,000 on more landscaping projects that included more rocks and more plants on a highway beautification project only a few miles down the road. Now let, let me say again, I think that highway beautification projects are very important. And I think that when local and state officials want to have that kind of beautification, along many of the freeways in my state, we planted cactus and bougainvillea and others. I think, I think that that's wonderful. But the fact is that when we have bridges that are actually dangerous for our constituents to use, then obviously we have to make some, some prioritization. As I mentioned, uh, Local officials who discussed the projects were quoted as saying, I'm talking about the Nevada um, graphics and big giant boulders and uh, ro rocks. Um, quote, we applied for the federal enhancement dollars and those federal enhancement dollars can only be used for landscaping, can only be used for landscaping and pedestrian type improvements. In other words, local officials, these local officials, officials in Nevada said they had no choice as to what to spend the money on. In addition, the INDOT, Nevada Department of Transportation Deputy Director for Southern Nevada, was quoted as saying, quote, it's really getting out of hand to where these pots of money have those constraints associated with them, and you can't spend money where you want to. Florida spent $3.54 million of stimulus transportation enhancement funding for a wildlife echo passage. The wildlife crosswork will be used by turtles and other animals that live in Lake Jackson, Florida. The turtle tunnel will consist of a series of fences that will direct all the animal traffic to a 13-foot tunnel that will go under the road. Even though Florida has received millions in stimulus funds for the tunnel, the permanent echo package is only in the design stage and is not fully funded. It needs $6 million more, and it's unclear how long it will take to get the project built. Meanwhile, Florida has over 1,800 bridges in need of repair or improvements. Other examples of wasteful and unnecessary mandated transportation enhancement projects include $400,000 for a Pennsylvania trolley museum, $23 million for a Tennessee bicentennial history memorial, $234,000 for an art walk in Vermont, $160,000 for a Roman bathhouse renovation in West Virginia, $500,000 for the renovation of the Toledo Harbor Lighthouse in Ohio, $150,000 for Salamander Crossing in Vermont, a million dollars for the North Carolina Transportation Museum, $178,000 for a railroad caboose relocation and renovation, $210,000 $790 for the Merchant and Drover's Tavern Museum in New Jersey, $40,000 spent on a new town sign in Iowa, 
for fencing around oil wells in Oklahoma, $500,000 for a Santa Ana train station mural, $120,000 to restore Crandall Farm in Rhode Island, $44,500 on welcome signs in South Carolina, $150,000 to print and produce brochures and replace a brochure display case in Kansas, $3 million on landscaping and a pedestrian walkway at the Indiana State Fairgrounds. So here we are with a billion dollars spent in just last year, more than $12 billion gone in the last, um, since 1992, and the numbers go up. So I would hope that my colleagues would vote to find it necessary that these kinds of funding would be prohibited for the programs such as I have outlined. And I have to be honest with my colleagues. If I had my way, about 80 cents out of every dollar in gas taxes, if I had my way, would stay in my home state of Arizona and in every state in America where it's collected. And then we'd let the governors and the city councils and the mayors and the county authorities make the decisions as to what that money should be spent on. I would remind my colleagues that we enacted the gas tax during the Eisenhower administration in order to build a national highway system. Long ago, the national highway system was completed, and yet the money still goes from our citizens to directly to the federal government when it should be going to the states to make the decisions which they can make best. I doubt, I doubt if many state authorities would have made the decisions such as I have just uh, described there. And I also believe that a lot of the uh, authorities and officials for in various states would agree with the deputy director of the Nevada Department of Transportation, director for Southern Nevada, who was quoted as saying, quote, it's really getting out of hand to where these pots of money have these constraints associated with them and you can't spend money where you want to. So I hope that my colleagues would vote in favor of that amendment. Now, uh, Madam President, uh, according to the previous agreement, I uh, will discuss amendment number 740, which is to eliminate funding for trade adjustment assistance for firms. I want to emphasize for firms. Now, again, in interest of full disclosure, I believe that trade adjustment assistance is a uh, is a compromise that was made back under President Clinton's administration when certain uh, free trade agreements, specifically, I, as I recall, NAFTA was agreed to, and the uh, trade adjustment assistance program was set up for individuals that would be adversely affected as a result of the enactment of free trade agreements. Now, we wouldn't have enacted the free trade agreements if we didn't believe that the overwhelming effect of free trade agreements would be beneficial to business in the United States and would result in hiring and jobs and a better economy. But I also understand that there may be individuals in specific cases where these free trade agreements hurt the businesses in certain places in the country. Now, I must say that I opposed the increase in the trade adjustment assistance, which was part of the deal made in order to ensure passage of the three free trade agreements that were just concluded in this body a short time ago. The free trade agreement with South Korea, Colombia, and Panama. But I do believe that there are some aspects of this program that we should examine more carefully. The TAA for Firms programs provides matching grants of up to $775,000 to
to firms that have been impacted by trade so that the firms can hire private sector consultants to help them become competitive. The program is administered through a network of regional nonprofit trade adjustment assistance centers who are chosen non-competitively. It's been my experience that wherever federal dollars, but wherever the federal government abandons competition, the American taxpayer usually loses. These TAACs have been known to charge exorbitant overhead rates of 60% of grant funding. And the Government Accountability Office has questioned the program's effectiveness and administrative costs. According to the President, this President, this administration, sent over a termination list with his fiscal year 2012 budget. The President of the United States proposed, and I quote, the administration proposes to eliminate the Economic Development Administration Trade Adjustment Assistance for Firms program. That is not the Senator from Arizona's proposal, although it is in this amendment. It is the President of the United States proposal, who I think it would be hard for my colleagues on the other side of the aisle to argue that he is insensitive to the plight of firms and individuals and companies that are affected by free trade agreements. Now, according to the President's termination list, the message that he sent over to Congress, the justification goes on to say, quote, the administration believes that it would be more effective to concentrate EDA's resources on public investments in infrastructure and institutions that provide, that promote innovation and entrepreneurship. The inclusion of this program in the President's termination list is strong evidence that we should no longer be funding the program. It also begs the question, why are we choosing to spend almost $16 million on a program we don't need and has consistently had its effectiveness questioned? This is money we don't have and don't need to spend. As I said before, I've always been skeptical of trade adjustment assistance and similar programs like this one for firms. I believe these programs are potential vehicles for government waste, market interference unfairly, but the government in the position and puts the government in the position of choosing winners and losers. I believe the evidence stating that trade adjustment assistance and similar programs achieve their goals is suspect as well. But that fight is over, at least for the time being. But I might add, there's still many questions about the TAA program. We need to analyze whether the TAA program is really doing what it is intended to do. The following are some of the questions and, and concerns that we should consider. Does the TAA program provide overly generous benefits to a narrow population? According to analysis from the Heritage Foundation, based on statistics from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, in the third quarter of fiscal year 2009, only 1% of mass layoffs were a result of import competition of overseas relocation. Another question, is there evidence that trade adjustment assistance benefits and training help increase participants' earnings? An analysis by Professor Kara M. Reynolds of American University found, quote, little evidence that TAA helps displaced workers find new, well-paying employment opportunities. In fact, TAA participants experienced a wage loss of 10 percent. The same study found that in 2007, the federal government appropriated $855.1 million to TAA programs. Of this amount, funding for training programs accounted for only 25 percent. In 2007, the Office of Management and Budget rated the TAA program as, quote, ineffective, unquote. The OMB found that the TAA program fails to use tax dollars effectively because, among other reasons, the program has failed to demonstrate the cost effectiveness of achieving its goals. The American people are hurting. Unemployment remains at unacceptable levels and is estimated to continue to grow. We need to cut unnecessary spending like this program at a time when our national debt has reached the unsustainable level, when the American people faced painful choices about how to cut our federal budget. Now, 
I want to say, uh, conclude again by saying that I don't believe that the trade adjustment assistance is a viable program. But I also understand what was decided by both sides of the House with the support of some of my Republican colleagues and that trade adjustment assistance was the price for passage of the three trade agreements that have been signed by the President of the United States. But I think in this case, on this particular program, where the President of the United States has asked for its termination because of its ineffectiveness, and it's, it would be, and I believe that it would be more effective to concentrate these resources on public investment in infrastructure and institutions that promote innovation and entrepreneurship, I hope that we would abide by the recommendation of the President of the United States, whom, as my colleagues know, I'm not always in total agreement with. Uh, Madam President, I yield the floor. Madam President. Senator from Pennsylvania. Thank you, Madam President. I uh, wanted to, re to respond to my colleague from Arizona on a couple of points. I rise uh, in opposition to his amendment, but I think there's a lot we agree on uh, based upon the remarks that he just gave about making sure the programs work and are efficient uh, to deliver results for taxpayers. I just don't agree with eliminating the program in this case, but I appreciate his, the words he said about uh, trade adjustment assistance and his recognition that workers uh, are going through a tough time right now. This amendment is really a disagreement about what we do about firms. And in this case, uh, it's pretty simple. We have trade adjustment assistance that helps individual workers, and, and I think there's a lot of agreement on that. But this particular program is about, about individual companies. Basically, what we're talking about here is about 265 firms in the country. The average quantum of assistance is uh, a little more than almost $62,000 per firm. And part of that is as simple as having a, uh, an expert come into a company that um, needs help be, and because of, of foreign competition, and I would say uh, unfair foreign competition, and helping them with their process, being able to produce a product in a more efficient way, changing an assembly line or giving advice in ways that sometimes a company is unable to figure out on their own. So it does provide that, that technical assistance. The other part about this is I think it's really an effort to make sure that these firms can better compete uh, in a very tough environment, frankly, that's often been undermined by trade agreements. That's my perspective. I know some don't share that. The other number I'd point to in terms of the effectiveness of the program is that 98 percent of the companies that have received this trade adjustment assistance help for their technical assistance or otherwise are in business uh, more than five years later. So I would, I would debate the, the, uh, the question about the effectiveness, but this is really, it's the same spirit or the same uh, belief that underlies trade adjustment itself is that when a worker is thrown out of a job because of unfair foreign competition or the ravages of a, of a tough economy, we say to that worker, we're going to retrain you to get you back into the workforce. And that's the purpose of the worker part of this. The same is true of a company. Sometimes a company gets their legs knocked out from under them in a bad economy. And we say to them, we're going to have a program that will allow an expert to come in and help you get through this period. And it's not, it's not um, unlimited. There's a limited amount of money available nationally for those 265 firms. So I think there's, there's a lot of agreement here, but a basic disagreement about the need for a particular trade adjustment program for, uh, for the companies. So I would uh, respectfully rise in opposition to uh, my friend from uh, Arizona's amendment. I give the floor. Madam President. I thank the Senator from Pennsylvania, and, I, and I'll be very brief. The President of the United States obviously weighed in very heavily in the administration in favor of renewal and even expansion of the Trade Adjustment Assistance Program. This amendment only applies to the portion of the Trade Adjustment Assistance Program that the President and the administration specifically pointed out as being ineffective and sent over as a program that they recommended termination. So I hope my colleagues are not uh, confused that this is an attack or an amendment which would destroy TAA. It would not. 
It only focuses very narrowly on the portion of the trade adjustment assistance that the President of the United States has requested that be terminated. And frankly, I don't think it would have a dramatic effect on the entire trade adjustment assistance, I'm sorry to say. Madam President, I yield the floor. President. The Senator from Alaska. Madam President, before I uh, respond to one of the amendments that was offered just a little bit ago, I first want to say I know my colleague from Alaska was down here on the floor talking about uh, today as Alaska Day. Uh, it was a great day for our country when the final transfer, transfer from Russia to uh, the United States, the great state of Alaska, which has had incredible resources that this country has benefited from. And I, I just want to wish all the people back home uh, a great Alaska Day. But, bef but I, wanna, I came down to the floor because I know my friend from Arizona, Senator McCain, has offered an amendment on elimination of transportation enhancements. And let me speak from two parts. One, uh, as a former mayor that dealt with this issue over and over again, uh, but also as uh, someone whose uh, family has been in the visitor industry and understands the power of a great community and what it can be and what it can do for uh, the long-term economic health of a community when you ensure that the infrastructure is designed and built right, and also someone from the real estate industry. But first, as a former mayor, uh, these issues we debated a great deal on transportation enhancements. And I know there will be issues at times, it doesn't matter if it's this program or the Defense Department or the Interior Department, I can name any department over the years that have had uh, issues that have come up that are not the most appropriate expenditure of the dollars. But when you look at enhancements and enhancements, uh, transportation enhancements, they're an incredible asset. I will tell you from Alaska's perspective, and I will tell you from the mayor of Anchorage, as I was for five years, uh, during that five years, five and a half years, we built more roads than the last three mayors combined over 15 years. In five years, we built a ton of roads to enhance our community. But the roads of the 50s and the 60s are no longer the viable roads of the future. In the old days, they used to build them, just pave them. Maybe you might put some curb on there. You might put a sidewalk, but barely. And that would be considered the road, the transportation network. But things have changed quite a bit. Uh, the roads we built in Anchorage not only had the, the, the pavement, the curb, the sidewalk, the transportation enhancements, the landscaping that goes along with it, because when you put all that into play, the net result is you get a better transportation network. You can also utilize it, as we have done on a couple of the roads in our neighborhoods, to slow down traffic so they would not be a danger to the children within the zone, uh, or in case of some where we've built uh, pedestrian uh, multi-use trails, which uh, I can point to several within our own area where I was mayor in Anchorage, where these trails became huge enhancements uh, for the neighborhood, but also to our visitors. When the visitors came and spent money in our economy, maybe they went to a place to visit or they went out fishing, but maybe they came back and wanted after dinner to take an evening walk. And these trails, which were well designed and landscaped properly, would be another experience that they would see and feel uh, and take back to their own hometown. This amendment that uh, Senator McCain has brought forward is opposed by not only the U.S. Conference of Mayors, but the National Tour Association, the U.S. Travel Association, the Southeastern Tourism Society, and many others are growing on the list because they see not only the value for improving the road infrastructure, but they see the value of attracting a quality of life that makes the property values better around these enha enhancements, the tourism that comes along with it, the value of economic development. And I think there's just a lack of understanding by some members because they like to pick one or two. And, and I would agree, there constantly we have to review these programs to make sure they're being used for the right purposes. But in this case, I will tell you, and I can show you project after project in Alaska where we saw a great value. It could be the Water Street improvements in Ketchikan, which during my time here uh, in the last two and a half years, I've seen that development change the front street of their community. Uh, the Kenai River Trail improvements, which many people know, the Great Kenai, which has incredible salmon fishing, but ensuring that those trails are safe. Uh, the enhancements, and why do you want those trail improvements? Because if you have people crawling all over the banks, you'll, you'll deteriorate the banks, you'll create 
erosion that result is you're destroying the habitat, which in turn destroys this great salmon creek. Or in, a, in Anchorage, where we improved Ship Creek with the same kind of enhancements. Why did we do that? Again, to make it safer for the pedestrians that were utilizing it. It was a great add to our tourism, but it also ensured that six plus million dollar fishery that Ship Creek was and is in Anchorage continued to thrive because we weren't damaging the habitat. I can go through one project after project after project that we utilized enhancements to improve the quality of our road projects. And I know some want to believe road projects are just this asphalt and uh, maybe a little drain and that's it. Well, I will tell you now, putting my hat on from the real estate industry, I spent many years in the real estate industry and what people looked for was the quality of environment around them. If you were on a strip paved road or a barely paved road with maybe a little drain and curb, it had a certain value. But if you were on a road that had a nice pedestrian pathway, nice curb and gutter and landscaping, I guarantee you those property values were stronger, better. The local community benefited from that because they now had stronger property taxes off those higher value properties. The homeowner benefited because they had an investment that would maintain its value because the quality of the infrastructure around it, the roads, the water, the sewer, and in this case the enhancements were of high quality. So for those that kind of brush these off as wasteful expenditures, I can show you again project after project that we took uh, substandard roads, enhanced them with transportation enhancement resources, dollars, and the net result is we had economic development occur around it. We had quality of life improve. We had better values in our properties that are owned by the private sector. May they be commercial or residential. So again, I would, I would strongly recommend to my friend from Arizona that I know it's easy because staffs run around here. They always want to get the worst case scenario of everything. We can all do that. That's easy to do. You can always find one project somewhere about something. But that's not what this is about. It's about the 90 plus percent, probably 98 percent of the projects that really are incredible enhancements to communities. And again, as a mayor, as someone who's been in the real estate industry, I have seen the value of these. As I mentioned also, uh, the organizations that don't support these. The tourism industry folks that I mentioned don't support these because they understand that when you are traveling to a community, it is not just about the one item you're going there, and let's use Alaska as an example, going there for king salmon fishing or, or maybe uh, in the wintertime skiing, whatever it might be. There's these other pieces that people experience. Uh, in Alaska, we have some great trail systems uh, that people rave about and they talk about. Wherever I go around the country, and I run into someone from Alaska, from, that visited Alaska, They'll tell me, oh, I was in, and they'll name the community. If they were in Anchorage when I was mayor, they would say, oh, I was in your city, and oh, by the way, I went on this trail or that trail. Ship Creek Trail is an example. Beautiful trail that at lunchtime, tons of people utilize. And it's a huge benefit for increasing the quality of life for our downtown. So again, I would encourage, and I, and I recognize, and there's things that I agree with, uh, with Senator McCain on multiple things we've actually worked on, defense authorization, but this one I just beg to differ on his rationale of getting rid of this resource. This is important for local communities. And the best part of this is, I want to emphasize, this is not congressional earmarks. It is money set aside that the local communities through their metropolitan planning efforts or in the state through their efforts decide on how to spend this money. It is the best way to allow local communities less federal control to do the right thing based on some uh, framework and guidelines here. So um, if you want less federal government, this is one of those programs that allow the flexibility on the local end to do the right thing, what they think will enhance their uh, road improvements in their communities. May they be small neighborhoods or major highways. Uh, I would, as I've always done to Senator McCain, I always do it, I always invite him to Alaska. Uh, I'll take them on the bypass, the scenic bypass, where you can drive, pull out, see some incredible beluga wells, see some incredible weather, go down to Girdwood, uh, see an incredible uh, rainforest at the same time. I will take them to four or five of these projects because they'll want to pull over to take the photos. And those will be fund federally funded projects that made the possibility, made it possible for you to do that. Why is that important? Because if you drive the new Seward Highway, the Seward Highway from Anchorage to Girdwood, 
It's not the most safest highway. These pullouts, these waysides, these enhancements have made it a safer place. You can pull over and see dull sheep walking on the side of the mountains right there. But instead of just stopping on the road and pulling off on the, on the, on the side there a little bit, you actually pull off into a wayside. Safer, better for tourism. It does the right thing ensuring that the project is a better project. So again, I would challenge my friend from Arizona that I will gladly take him on many of these projects and show him the value of what's done, what we have done with them, and the economic opportunity that goes along with it, and the jobs that are created with it, and the long-term benefit to the values of the properties that are associated with these improvements that are in the private sector. So, Madam President, I want to thank you for allowing me a few minutes also again to wish my friends and uh, all my constituents back home a great Alaska Day, but also to talk about an important amendment that I think would be uh, the wrong direction if we vote for it. Thank you very much. I yield the floor.